Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Doc. Greetings, Christina, and greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide today, along with Christina, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy in search of optimal health. And we're going to move kind of quickly today because we have a very special show. If you remember, in uh, episode 132, we met Scott Spaulding. Uh, he was a patient who is a client of mine. Uh, and he was diagnosed at age 49 with colorectal cancer. We met him when he was starting to go through his chemotherapy and radiation, and he's about to have his surgery when we talked to him last time. So he's already had his surgery, and I want to introduce him quickly because we're doing something very unique today. We're actually having our show, and we're interviewing Scott uh, from his hospital bed. We won't mention the name of the hospital, but... We are talking to him through his hospital bed. So, Scott, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina and Glenn, for having me on the show. Oh, yes. Well, thank you, Scott, for all your courage and uh, being able to join us today from your hospital room. Adds a little bit of drama. Yeah, we love the drama part. And, and reminding everybody that one of the reasons that you agreed to do this was to, to essentially give service to people and show them what it was like and what it is like going through this whole process. And if you remember, when we were, when we were about to prepare for surgery, you still did not know the extent of the problem. You didn't know what the surgery was going to be, and you didn't know how you were going to come out of it. And that's where we stood, and that's where I'd like to pick up, Scott. So uh, when we last talked, you were about uh, a week or so away from surgery. What was it like preparing for the surgery? Well, you never know what a surgical outcome is going to be. And so the best you can do is, is prepare yourself, mind, body, spirit, make yourself as strong as possible for the best possible outcome. And that's what I was doing with your help. And um, I, I was trying to uh, you know, strengthen my body as much as I could as well as my mind and spirit, and I think that played a real factor in my in my surgery because it was a very good outcome. What were the what were the toughest parts preparing? Well, there's there's an element of uncertainty, you know, and there's really nothing you can do about the uncertainty except accept it and um, you know just prepare for uh, different types of outcomes. Um, it was. You know, as far as the physical preparation, trying to strengthen my body, there's a there's an element of discipline that I can sometimes lack, um, and so at times it was hard to try to work on my core, which is where my surgery was going to be. Um, but you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that for me personally, preparing for surgery was an ordeal. I knew it was going to happen. I went through chemo, chemo and radiation first, and you know, I had a date on the calendar, and I and I knew you know where it was going to be and and who I was going to do it, and I had a lot of confidence in my surgeon, and that made it um, much easier for me to prepare for. What was your surgical uh, visit like before you had the surgery? You met with the surgeon one last time before the surgery. What kind of things did you discuss? Well, I had a pre-op with him about a month before the surgery, and he gave me another examination and said that as, as a result of the radiation, the tumor had actually shrunk since he had seen it originally, and there was still a month to go. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he, he, was, uh, he's, he seems pretty um, uh, mainstream in terms of preparation, you know, eat right, exercise. Um, so there wasn't really, uh, I, I wouldn't say that he gave me a regimen for preparing for surgery. Now, one of the things that was happening with the surgery is there are lymph nodes in your pelvis that we didn't know about, whether or not they were cancerous. Uh, we did get some good news that the uh, tumor itself was shrinking in the colorectal area. <clears throat> but there was also the possibility of having a colostomy or ileostomy, right? I think there was the, the surgery, the planned surgery was an ileostomy, which is temporary. and. Right. So that's what, um, and, and the surgeon was quite confident that that would be 
what he would be performing based on where the tumor was and the, the stage it was at. And there was an uncertainty because of the level of medical technology that we have right now about whether, in fact, the lymph nodes were affected by the cancer. Mm-hmm. So just to talk about the ileostomy for a few moments and to explain to our viewers and listeners, uh, it's, a, it's a procedure where they take a portion of the intestine and bring it out through the abdominal wall, just a small opening, and then a bag is placed over that so that all of the food that you eat, uh, instead of being digested and going all the way through your body and coming out through the rectal area like it normally does, it's diverted and it comes out through the ileum, which is the uh, last part of the small intestine before it before food enters and attaches uh, to the large intestine. So you were a little concerned about that. How did you deal with that? Well, I think anyone would be concerned about that because it's not the norm. Um, and again, you know, for me, it was, I was very thankful that it was not expected to be permanent mm -hmm. and it was expected to be um, easily reversible. And so that turned out to be the case, at least so far. So mm -hmm. I, that, I found quite a bit of solace in, in that prognosis, looking at it along the lines of, you know, I, can, I, can, I feel like I can handle a short, you know, stretch of, you know, rough, rough times as opposed to a much longer period of maybe the same kind of rough time. Or, or permanent. So you did a little research on it, and you uh, talked to some professional, what we call ostomy nurses, right? Um, I did talk to one ostomy nurse before the surgery, just in terms of preparing to see what I would need after the um, after the surgery, and um, what I learned was that most ileostomies and colostomies, I think, are unique and are dealt with typically after surgery in terms of the ostomy care. And so in this hospital where I am right now, I met for the first time with the ostomy nurse yesterday, going to meet with her again today. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was a very good meeting. And it was, um, and I changed my bag out to a, to a, um, a much easier, a much better designed bag. And so now that a Gucci me, bag. The, yeah, not quite. Uh, but but you are accessorizing, right? Uh, not yet on that either. Um, but it's it was you know it gives you a certain level of. I mean, I'm I'm aware that I'm going to get to a, a confidence level and to a familiarization level with all of this over time. But you know, the first time is always. Uh, I don't want to necessarily say hardest hardest, but it has the most mystery to it, and so. You know, the faster you can demystify things and learn what things are and how they work, the better. That's a really good point. I like that. Um, you think you'll ever get to the point where when they're about to reverse it and take it away, you'll miss it so much you'll not want to have it removed? Absolutely not. Okay. Just checking on that. <laughs> <laughs> it can happen, you know? You never know. So, Scott, uh, let's talk about now it's the morning of the surgery. Anything uh, special that day? Walk us through a little bit of what you remember in terms of the actual surgery itself. Were you in the hospital the night before? No, my surgery was on Friday, scheduled for uh, uh, one o'clock, I think. And, and I, it was about an hour and a half drive from my house. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually took off Wednesday and Thursday from work to, you know, line myself up for surgery mentally, do all the kind of preparation that I needed because I was told I was going to be in the hospital or expect to be in the hospital for a week, which is pretty standard. And, um, the, since, since we could drive to the hospital, I think check-in was scheduled for 11. And so, uh, my wife and I spent some time on Friday morning together, you know, just talking about it and preparing before we, um, and we spent the day together on Thursday as well. But Friday morning was just kind of one last, you know, time together with the two of us before the surgery. And then we drove down and checked in and uh, pretty much went, went to pre-op straight from there. 
Before, you know, you brought up something interesting. What was it when you say you and your wife spent time together? Many people are going to go through this, and part of the process here is to help people in their own process as they go through it. Not always necessarily is it a wife or a husband. It may be a friend or a, another relationship. What kind of things uh, are important in that moment? Well, for us, it was, you know, remembering I've, we've, been, we've been together 27 years and remembering that each of us is the most important person in the other's life and that we're a team and that we're going to continue to be a team as we go through this. And it was just, you know, we each draw strength from each other when we're together and when we can be together um, in, a, in a sort of isolated way and really concentrate on being in each other's presence, you know, we can we can gain some strength from that, which is important for when you're going into surgery. So I, I would certainly recommend anyone that has a partner to do something similar if, if you have that strength in your partner and draw from that. Oh, that's beautiful. Is there anything that um, you, the two of you did to, because you were obviously at one point going to be separated, you were having surgery and she was going to, going to be in a waiting room. Is there anything you did kind of mentally, spiritually that's, that connected the two of you while you were away? I'm not sure I'm asking the question correctly, but I, I think you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, we didn't do anything overt um, or, or really specific. I think it was more just spending time together and, you know, beforehand, 24, 36 hours beforehand, you know, we didn't, we didn't, um, we spent about an hour together in pre-op because the surgery was actually delayed mm -hmm. about uh, pretty close to 90 minutes, I think, mm -hmm. um, which does not make a surgeon happy, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we were sitting together in the little pre-op area, which was a, quite a bustling hub of activity because you're not in a room. It's, a, it's, a, it's like an airport terminal. You each have a little curtained area, and people are coming in and out, and, and gurneys are, are you know wheeling by, and, and people are going into surgery and talking to each other, and family members are coming in. And so um, we spent much more time there than we... Uh, thought we would because the surgery was delayed. So several people came and talked to us. You know, the anesthesiast came and talked to us. We learned later that was because the surgery was delayed and he was looking for something to do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that gave us time to just, you know, just to, again, spend that time together right, right before the surgery. And what, what uh, was the interaction with the anesthesiologist? Anything that you want to tell us that we should know? Well, you know, um, anesthesiologists, anesthesiologists have an interesting job, you know, they, they, and it's one of the most important cause they have to, um, make sure that everything is just perfect for each individual case. Uh, but you don't, you don't talk to them until right before the surgery. And you d usually, you don't see them afterwards because their job was successful when you, as long as you wake up. And so, that, um, you know, we, we chatted with him. He was a very pleasant guy, and we chatted with him for a minute about a couple different things. He asked us, you know, three, four, five times if we had any questions, mm -hmm. and um, that, was, that was about it. He was, it was, um, uh, you know, per your advice, which I, I really liked and I think um, was great, you know, you said to uh, make sure that to do your best, the last thing you do before you go under is, you know, crack a big smile and, and see if you can do that when you wake up too. And so I let him know that and to give me a, to give right. me a cue, to give me a cue when I should do that, you know, because he's the one that puts you under. And at one point after we were, um, outside the operating room, uh, he, he said, now would be a good time to do that. And in, in, in my particular case, because the operation was delayed, uh, the surgeon, I came out and spoke with me while I was lying in the gurney right outside the room for, you know, five or 10 minutes. We were just, um, you know, chatting for a while. And of course I was trying to get him in as good a mood as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you, a lot of times it's always important to say it's the right knee, not the left knee. Did you want to make sure he knew who you were and everything? <laughs> there was a little bit of that. I said, Hey, you know, it's, I, don't forget I'm at 12.5 centimeters. 
Yeah, because I, was that a concern for you? The fact that the tumor got so small, maybe he wouldn't find it. And well, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't have any idea. The last I had heard was when I had that pre-op a month before, and he, it was uh, it was visible, it was evident. And so we learned later when he was talking to my wife that um, it had actually shrunk down so so significantly to the point where all that was left was a scar. And that's mm. what, I mean, they knew where the tumor was, but the radiation had essentially eliminated the tumor and, of course, killed all the adjacent lymph nodes that the radiation had targeted. And so they, and he had his, his partner in the operating room, which was great, his surgical partner. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they both kind of consulted and, um, you know, wanted to make sure you know, that's where it was and that they were getting the section that they needed to get, which they did. So when you, when, uh, you were medicated now, did they med- pre-medicate you while you were in the waiting room? Uh, no, they didn't. They didn't. Okay. So you, you smile and you go to sleep and the next thing yeah, that happened. First, I, first I had to get from the gurney onto the actual operating table. I think they liked the patient to do that. And I, I would have preferred to have not. Um, I've had a couple of other surgeries, outpatient surgeries, and you know my preference is to not see the operating room. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you accidentally saw it, and and you smile and go to sleep, and then you wake up. Do you remember smiling again? I don't, because you know, of course, you're you're um, you're totally out of it, and mm-hmm. so I don't I don't really have any strong memories of being in the recovery room. Uh, Mm -hmm. my wife wasn't able to visit me there. They had to wait until they got me in a, in a, in my room where I am now. And they, uh, which is where they met me. She had a brother and her uncle with me, with her, with her. Mm -hmm. And they, um, so I don't know. I don't really remember. I, I kind of have some, um, uh, fleeting, uh, memories of being in the recovery room, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to swear by them. Yeah, we ha- we actually did an interview with an anesthesiologist, Dr. Jeffrey Block, and we talked a lot about anesthesia. It's a very interesting process to go into and under anesthesia and then come out of it. So what were your first recollections when you uh, came out of it? Um, I, I believe that I was in the room. This was Friday night. The surgery was about, you know, 3.30 to 5.30 or 3 to 5.30, something like that. And uh, I got into the room, to my room here about 6.30 or 7. And I was just kind of starting to come out of it. Still very, very groggy. And uh, um, I remember having some conversations with with my wife and with her brother. Um, but again, I... I I, I was told, and I vaguely remember cracking a few jokes, so I think, I think that means that I, I did well. Do you remember the jokes? I don't think it's fit, even for the Internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, t- so you can blame that on the anesthesia. Normally, you would never say anything like that, but under anesthesia, you, didn't, you couldn't be held responsible. I'll Christina, any thoughts? Uh, I, this is... Um quite amazing the way that you can actually remember all the steps that you've come through scott that's uh, pretty amazing and uh, i love it i love it i wish you could share the jokes <laughs> maybe you can share them we just put the beepers in between <laughs> right <clears throat> all right so so scott i i actually talked to your wife uh before she got to see you out of the surgery and one of the things that's always important that i talk to people about, especially the person that's in the waiting room, is to say, and this is almost impossible, but don't look at the clock because right. sometimes surgeries will be delayed. You're thinking that he's in surgery or the person is in surgery and because it's taking so long, there are obviously complications. It's very bad, but it was mm-hmm. just a question of delays. So finally, the two of you got together. What was that moment like again, uh, reuniting in a, in a moment? Well, again, you know, I, this was Friday night, and I was pretty groggy, and my memories aren't really clear from that. But I think uh, my wife was the one that gave me the, the the good news about the the success of the surgery and the good news of the surgery. And so, um, 
that was obviously, you know, very, very positive. I think um, she just told me something last night about when she was waiting and she had family with her. And so that's important. But Mm -hmm. you never know what the word is going to be when the surgeon walks out of the hallway and talks to you. Right. So it's, it's just it can be traumatizing. Yeah, so now you're coming out of it, and you're lying in your hospital bed where you still are right now, and this is Friday night. Give us a little bit about what the course was going to be like, uh, both on an emotional level for you and on a physical level. Well, physically, you know, I was pretty banged up because of what they did. It was laparoscopic surgery, so that's great, you know, as opposed to cutting me wide open. But... um, I was I was pretty out of it on Friday night. I think I remember talking with uh, my brother in law and my wife, and and we had, were talking about the the fact that the surgery uh, had very good results, and so there was a lot of positivity in the room. And uh, uh, my wife has, has spent the night with me in the room each night here, and that's been really important again to that bonding and. Um, Really, for me, I think things really started happening on Saturday, the next day, when I woke up. Of course, no one sleeps in a hospital. They wake up all the time and, and do all kinds of things to you. So, um, you know, I haven't had a good night's sleep in, uh, since Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that, as I think a lot of people know, is they want you to start walking right away. And so... I was able to uh, not only get out of bed, but take a, a short walk uh, within 24 hours of this surgery. And, and that gave me some strength that I was doing okay. Uh, what about emotionally now? Well, this is a big emotional um, you know, roller coaster. Uh, there's ups and downs. And I think, as you pointed out, there's uh, all kinds of potential effects for the medications that I'm on. I, was on a, I had an internal pain pump. Uh, that was just taken out today. So that, that was in there for three and a half days. And I would think I was on, um, you know, all kinds of blood thinners and, and other types of drugs, anticoagulants. And so you don't know what kind of impact those drugs will have on your emotional state. But uh, my, my emotional state, I think, has been really thankful that it was a good outcome. And uh, you know, f- four days after the surgery, and I'm going to be uh, checking out of the hospital tomorrow. So, you know, five days back home, we're looking forward to going back home to where I think not only can you get really good sleep, but I think the real healing will start when you're in your own home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, it's, uh, for again, for me, because it was a successful outcome, um, there's, there's, there's certainly a lot more positive than there is negative on the emotional front. Mm-hmm. When at this point in time, have they took out the cancer and they reconnected your colon down in the colorectal area in your pelvis, right. and they also took out the lymph nodes, and that's an important part of this to see if the lymph nodes were affected. Do you know the results of that yet? No, we don't have the path reports yet. Uh, we're expecting them uh, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And how are you preparing for that? Because it could go either way. It could go to everything looks good or things don't look that good. So what's... Yeah, it could go either way. Um, you know, there's an expectation based on the prior four months that I've been going through this that the lymph nodes were infected. And so um, obviously it would be fantastic news if no cancer was found in any of the lymph nodes that they took out. Right. You know, it's my understanding that they take out enough lymph nodes, enough healthy ones, to be able to know how far it may have spread. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and I did hear from the surgeon, who I met with both today and yesterday, uh, that uh, there were certainly lymph nodes that were taken out that were appeared quite dead from the radiation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the I think the real question is if they find. I mean, obviously, the best outcome would be that, you know, all the nodes are negative. Then right. that's kind of a decision point. Um, you know, there's a there's a uh, possibly a gray area if there is a node positive that was clearly dead because of the radiation and all the all the healthy nodes that were taken out 
were not impacted. And then you get into some um, some some questions about you know course course of treatment, uh, what what's you know long term, short term side effects for the second round of chemo, which I've always planned on uh, undergoing, which would be another eighteen weeks, probably starting next month. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be a little bit more intense, but again. Uh, that will be determined by what's next. What, I know that while, just to go backward a little bit, during the surgery, I think that the surgeon, aside from just taking care of the uh, colorectal area and the lymph nodes in that area, also checked out your liver to make sure there was nothing there. And what I had heard is that everything looked good in your liver also. We always get concerned about metastases to the liver, which is never a good sign. But that yeah, came out yeah, pretty that, good. I, I had I had heard uh, we we did go over that with the surgeon uh, yesterday, and he he said that everything that he saw looked good. Yeah, that's such a good feeling to have that. You know, speaking about being in the hospital and not sleeping and everything, a very important part of a patient being in the hospital has to do with nursing. And when you're in there for a number of days, you see different shifts and, and shift work, and this nurse comes in, that nurse comes in. What's your experience with the nursing? Well, in this particular hospital, and we won't name it, um, I have noticed a uh, variability in the, I would say, probably level of care of the nursing staff. Um, you know, there's just like everything, you know, there's some, you know, some good and some better. Um, and so I've certainly experienced that. Um, and there, there's, uh, you know, in a, in a hospital ward, there, there are nurses and then there are CNAs, all kinds of other staff that are doing all, that have all kinds of different responsibilities. And, you know, one of the things that impacts that level of care for any individual patient is how many patients any nurse might have. So if a nurse has four patients, you know, those four patients would get uh, more attention than if that nurse had seven or eight patients. And, and, you know, there's just no way to control that because of the way, you know, care is provided uh, from, uh, um, you know, anything can happen on any kind of a day. So you never know who's going to be in a room, but that, that can definitely impact the level of care, um, and and I think in my case, it probably did a little bit. Give me an example of that. Well, if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a if you have a nurse that has you know eight patients, and I mean a, a specific example for me wouldn't wouldn't be I wasn't able to get care. You know, you can obviously always push the button, and in this facility, there there was a pretty high level of responsiveness which was great. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain bedside manner and level of professionalism and attentiveness and, and really personal care that any person can really give to another. Obviously, nursing care, that's the core mission of that. And in different people, because of different personalities and different training, that can come through, you know, in different level, in different, you know, strength levels. And I've, I've certainly experienced that just in terms of, I, here's an example. You, I'll, I'll give you the example that you asked for. And that's um, one of the nurses I hear that, that I had here um, came in and just asked me how I was doing. And I, I didn't expect that based on a couple of uh, prior days of, um, of nursing care here. And so that was just a higher level of attention and and empathy than than I had received, and you know it was great. I mean, you know, you you want you want to experience that kind of stuff. It really makes a difference, doesn't it, with a great nurse? It really does, and I, I can attest to that for sure. Yeah, I know that when I was working in the emergency department and all my years, even in medical school, when I first started training and I started working on the hospital wards, you clearly recognize that the nurses. Uh, really were so important, and the great nurses just, they shined. It was beautiful, and you can right. tell. We always talk about doctors having bedside manner, but you don't think about not only the nurses, but all the different techs and the people that are walking in the room to do different things for you. Um, it's all very important, and it makes a big difference in your stay. Now, Absolutely. 
One of the things that's, uh, especially when someone has colorectal surgery and anesthesiology, is how a person progresses in terms of diet. So when somebody first starts having this surgery, the doctor does not want to feed the person by mouth. They want to let everything rest. So you're getting uh, all of your nutrition through intravenous uh, means. But right. then as you progress, you go from, well, you tell us. Uh, and this helps to determine how quickly you're progressing. So uh, when did you first start uh, having, say, liquids or well, I, I was uh, I was on IV the, on day one, and on day two I started having liquid foods. In my case, uh, for lunch and dinner that day, I had some soup, and I didn't really I didn't really have and it was good. Um, and I I didn't I didn't quite have my appetite back yet. You know, obviously still kind of adjusting to the whole thing, and of course I still am. But um, I would say that my appetite probably came back on day three, probably in the afternoon. And, and today, day four, I was able to eat solid foods, which was great. So I had some French toast for breakfast and it was fabulous. Wow. Now, just to make sure that people understand when doctors are making the decision about how to feed someone after, uh, a heavy-duty surgical procedure like you had, it's not as necessarily about your appetite, although that's an important part of it. It's really about how your body is functioning and, and preparing to take on the, uh, the food. Right. So for me, you know, the question is for, for maybe it's all GI um, surgeries, but in my case, there were three tests that you have to have before you're able to go home. One is your GI tract is working, and that means that, you know, food and gas is passing. Mm -hmm. And the other one is that you need to be able to essentially walk around. Mm -hmm. So if you're at home, you need to be able to walk to the bathroom, and they want to make sure that you can do that before you leave the hospital. Okay. Um, and so, you know, you, you want to wait until and, – and for me, my GI tract started working on day two. And, and it, who knows, maybe even, you know, day one, I was on an IV, but, uh, it was, it, it was definitely working, um, early. And, um, I, I, like I said, I, I was able to take a short walk on day one and walked quite a bit on day two. It's certainly much more of a hassle to have an IV, um, to be tied to an IV. And I, I lost the IV today. So Congratulations. that was great. Yeah, that's 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 real freedom there, uh, because you don't be, because it's plugged in, and if you have to get up and go to the bathroom, you have to unplug it, and then plug it back in when you get back, and that's um, for someone like me who has a, quite a sore stomach, that can be difficult. So, um, so those those um, those were those boxes have been checked for me, and I think that's why I'm going home tomorrow. That's great. You know, it's interesting to realize perspective when you say losing the IV was real freedom. <laughs> it is. I mean, you know, I, I, and I had a taste of it yesterday because they disconnected me for a couple of hours ah. and I was able to, you know, walk around and, and, you know, act like a normal person, not tied to, to a mobile IV or just have a, you know, have a trail, uh, have a, have a, an IV tube trailing you. And, uh, and then you hooked back up again. You feel like you're, you know, tethered again. And so it came off uh, permanently this morning and, and that was great. So let's talk about the, uh, the bag on your side now that you've never had before. Well, it's not. You... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I knew that. I, uh, so what was it like uh, being introduced to your new partner for the first time? Well, you know, I knew I, knew I was going to have it. Um, and I knew it was going to be temporary. And so that, that was really important for me. Um, what I didn't know was of course, how it worked or anything like that and how it would be, you know, drained or changed or whatever. And on, you know, day one and day two, um, the nurses were doing all that. And, um, on day three yesterday, the, the ostomy nurse came and, and changed my bag and gave me some training. 
And that was, um, like I said before, it gave me uh, a little sense of uh, a little more confidence and knowledge about um, how to take care of myself. Um, you know, it's no fun. Um, and it is what it is. And it's not going to kill you. Uh, it's certainly inconvenient. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, I was thinking about this this morning and yesterday. The, in my case, having a temporary bag is the cost of living. And, you know, my timeline is the next 30 or 40 years, not the next uh, three or four months. That's a great point. Mm-hmm. Any other advice for people that might be doing that? I've had other clients that knew they were going to get a colostomy or an ileostomy, and many of them were so fearful, they didn't even want to look at it. And it took them maybe three, four, five days before they would even look at it. Did you have any was, of that experience? Uh, I w- no, I was certainly looking at it. On, I mean, it's hard to avoid. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, again, it's the, the, it's going to be demystified. You, you're going to learn about it. It's going to be part of your life. And it could be, you know, an ileostomy or colostomy or any one of a thousand other things. And you may as well, my philosophy is you may as well learn it sooner rather than later because you're just wasting time if you're doing anything else. Mm, good point. So, Scott, when you had this surgery, uh, <clears throat> you're, you're different now than you were before you went into the surgery, clearly physically. Can you feel any differences in you physically, mentally? We talk about body, mind, and spirit. So you're never going to be the same person. Where do you feel you are now, and what's your the next part of your journey? Well, the next part of my journey is um, I was always planning it on the 18 weeks of chemo, and that is currently the plan until the PATH re- reports and my oncologist would say otherwise. Mm-hmm. That it, th- this, uh, this ileostomy can, revert, can be reversed as soon as seven weeks, you know, we learned, which would obviously be fantastic, but, uh, not necessarily counting on that. I think what I'm focusing on is the next six months of getting through a second round of chemo, you know, living with the ileostomy and again, having that focus on the temporary nature of the bag and what my life will be and how much I will enjoy it when, the um, when the bag's off and it's reconnected and I'm I'm back to a, a more conventional lifestyle. Any thoughts for other people that you would talk to them about in terms of moving forward after the surgery? Well, um, you know, again, I think I probably said this on the last show. Everyone's different. Uh, everyone approaches the challenges that they see in their lives uh, differently. But as far as uh, me, I think what helps me excuse me what what helps me is that i tend to adopt a, a longer term uh timeline and perspective so that mm. you know i'm i'm 50 and i'm not 80 and that's a significant difference because medical treatment for an 80 year old would be different for a 50 year old and approaches uh to what you might do um in terms of you know aggress- something that might be more or less aggressive and so I think I think that it's important for anyone that's facing a medical challenge to be able to look at what how they want the rest of their life to be and do everything that they can be to be in control of how that life is lived and to a large extent um, the control is possible because you can do things like change your change your change your mind body and spirit and uh, Certainly changing diet, certainly changing lifestyle, uh, certainly changing uh, the way you approach life is up to you. And the presumption is, and I believe this, that there are changes that anyone can make to improve their life, regardless of whatever medical challenge is in front of them, that they will benefit from. Great words of wisdom. Mm, Very much so. Um, Scott, I have a question. Uh, you're going home tomorrow. Um, did uh, Are there very specific needs that you're going to have when you go home? Is there certain preparations that you, um, that you and your wife have, 
had to do before you even entered the hospital? Um, the short answer is no. You know, uh, having a colostomy or an ileostomy is, uh, it, it's, it's certainly a life-changing experience, but it's not necessarily a life-altering one. And you can, you can live, you know, 99% of a normal life um, with, uh, with, with one of those operations. And so as long as you know what to do, uh, you can do that, you know, almost anywhere and how to, how to handle it. And, and, you know, I'm learning that today and yesterday. And so I don't think that we have to do anything, uh, any radically, you know, any radical changes in our, in our lifestyle in terms of how to cope uh, for the next several months. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So like, you, there's no need for like a hospital bed or a very specific diet. I mean, you can basically eat well. Yeah, I think there's with a with a bat with an external bag or a diversion bag is often what it's called. There's often some things that you would probably want to avoid for um, uh, digestive reasons. I think, uh, and we're learning about that now. I think fiber is one. Um, you don't want to have a lot of that. Easily digestible foods. Chew your foods. That kind of thing. You know, make things easy on your system. And uh, so we'll certainly be doing that. Um, but you know nothing. Nothing. Probably some things that you know people should be doing anyway, whether they have mm-hmm. this or not. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Scott. Is there anything while you're in the hospital? You've been there for a number of days now. Is there anything that you're looking forward to or that you miss by being in a hospital? You know, sometimes I think of this. People are in a hospital sometimes for weeks and months, a uh, very long time. You've been there for a few days. But is there anything that you miss about? not being in the hospital and anything you're looking forward to when you get home? Well, I'm certainly looking forward to being at home. Um, you know, everyone likes to nest and that's, that's, you know, sleeping in my own bed and, uh, using my own bathroom and watching my own television, uh, not being in a, in a hospital where you're surrounded by sick people. Um, you know, hospitals are, while they are, areas where facilities that where you get better and are cured hopefully uh they're not necessarily a curative atmosphere in here because there's lots of sickness and there's lots of um negative energy in hospitals and so you know you want to try to surround yourself with positive energy and and a lot of positive energy depending on your situation can come from your home so i would certainly look forward to being at home and being in a much more comfortable place than a, than a hospital. Will you be able to shower with your new accessory? I've been told that, uh, that the uh, new accessory is waterproof, that I will be able to do that. That's something I'll confirm again today when I meet with the ostomy nurse again. Excellent. Uh, Scott, we're coming kind of close to the end. We're cutting it a little short because we don't want to interrupt your healing time. And you've been so kind to us to offer this uh, interview while you're in your hospital bed. And we're so appreciative of that. Uh, This is obviously strange, but do you have any health tip for us? Well, I think on the last show, you asked for one. I gave you two. I'd like to do that again. One one is... um, for anyone that's facing a major medical challenge, I think, if especially if you have a partner like I do, anything you can do to try to find humor throughout the entire process will benefit you. I think humor is a is a really powerful medicine. And you know, when my wife and I were walking around the ward last night, she was laughing, you know, pretty hard at <laughs> uh, at something, and I don't even remember what it was, but laughing is really, really good for you. So to the extent that you can find humor in some of the challenges that are facing you, and there's plenty of it, I can tell you. There's, uh, we've laughed quite a bit throughout this process so far. It's, it's definitely, um, definitely beneficial. And, and the, other, this, the, the second tip I'd give you is, um, or I'd provide your, your listeners and, and, and viewers, is when you're in a hospital and, and you're there for several days and you're recovering from something or facing something, uh, I think a smart thing to do is to ask the nurses and the uh, medical staff what what have they seen that works 
for other people that have faced what you're facing because they've seen, mm. you know, hundreds, if not more cases that are very similar or identicals to yours. And they've seen all kinds of, uh, you know, different success rates and they may have, they may have tips. The nurse, the CNA may have tips about what to do, uh, what not to do, uh, to try to make yourself healthier, to try to, um, navigate whatever it is that's facing you a little bit easier. Um, to, and, and, and they, they know, you know, because they see it every day. And so, and it will very likely be something that you've never thought of, but, um, but they, and you and may have never heard of that, uh, because you, you know, you didn't research exhaustively on, on what might be the best way to handle it, but they see it every day and they might tell you to, you know, breathe more or, you know, do this or, or, you know, everyone knows walking is good for you, but you know, there's or mental exercises, who knows what it is, but, uh, ask and you shall receive, I think from the medical staff. Those were, those were really Wonderful. great. Uh, now in the, in our last, and thank you for those <clears throat> in our last, uh, episode when we talked to you after we finished you had mentioned that you felt that you wanted to be more humorous so is there anything right now uh before we end this show today that you want to tell us that might be so that you won't have to say oh i wish i was funnier well i guess i wasn't to start with if you're saying that at the end of the show (laughs) Well, I've been I've been trying to get you to do something, and we came close when you said you had some jokes, but then you teased us a little bit by telling us you couldn't tell them. <laughs> well, you know, I I, um, I love to laugh, and um, I, I would I would I think I would just say to that that uh, I did watch the last show, and I, I I was obviously a little dour at the beginning of it, and I think I lightened up throughout, and. I, I think I tried to make a little bit more of an effort today, even though I'm sitting in a hospital bed on a, uh, you know, on a Skype video call to try to uh, have a little bit more of a smile uh, throughout, throughout the show. No, it's beautiful. Is there anything else you want to tell us before we uh, end today? Nothing other than uh, if I exceeded my data cap, I'll send you a bill. <laughs> <laughs> Magicalmedicaltour.org. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Uh, no, that's great. Uh, Christina, any thoughts? Oh, just uh, this is a fabulous show, and it, it's uh, the first for Yoga Hub, of course, interviewing somebody in a hospital and really getting the play by play. So it's very exciting, and you've really helped us move forward another step, Scott. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show, and I think it's great. I'm I'm really happy to give back, and, and if anyone can learn from this show, you know, that's fantastic. Yeah, and we really appreciate that, and I know many of our viewers and listeners also appreciate that and are learning from you. So our plan now, Scott, just to let everyone know, is that <clears throat> you're going to go home, and then there's going to be a little break time, and then you're going to uh, start on the more intensive uh, chemotherapy, which is going to be, this time, I understand, intravenous therapy rather than uh, taking pills orally. Right, right, correct. So... Uh, we're planning on doing another show with you uh, somewhere along the way during the chemo uh, to see what else is going on and how you're doing. And we're right. really looking forward to that. Christina? Yeah, yeah that's, the, that's, the, that's the plan. And that, you know, um, that'll probably, you know, happen and start in about a month or so based on, you know, previous projections when the chemo would start and again last for uh, 18 weeks. Mm. Are you doing any journaling, by the way? I'm not going to get in trouble if I, if I admit <laughs> that I'm not doing it. Yes. I've, been a, I've been a little busy in the last couple of days. Going. <laughs> what a wimp. <laughs> mental, mental, mental. <laughs> it's okay. You, you have your iPhone there. There's co- something called voice recording. <laughs> Wow, I'm getting it from both ends. <laughs> it's hey, well worth it. I got to say, this show it's well count worth for it. Something? <laughs> yeah, th- yeah, that's right. Segovia has pointed out that we'll count this as journaling. Yeah, right. I, lo- I love that. <laughs> yeah, of course you do. So, 
one of the things that's important that you should consider is uh, an appreciation for the nursing team, although there were some that might not have been as, as uh, wonderful with great bedside manner. Certainly some of them, as you've said, have been brilliant for you that have really made a difference. It's always nice to uh, let them know that, a card, uh, some flowers. Everyone always used to give C's candy to the <laughs> nursing station. We would see hundreds of boxes of this candy. Uh, <laughs> but now that we're more nutritionally oriented. Uh, a round of smoothies. A round of smoothies, definitely. <laughs> Something well, I, good. I think, we're, I think we're ahead of you because, uh, you know, we're going to be coming back here. And we want to be on a, with a couple of different nurses that I've had here, I've said, and this could be a third tip, um, you know, why not, why not try to be the best patient that some of these nurses have ever had? Uh, wow. Because yes. when you give, you know, you, you receive as well. And so we certainly, I, I'm, you know, one of the things I've learned through this process is to be grateful. And I'm certainly grateful of the nursing staff here and definitely, definitely will be expressing that. And it's not just because I'll be coming back here and I don't want them to remember me in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's nothing wrong with that part either. You said it. Definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm extremely grateful to our very special guest, Scott Spaulding, who has gone uh, above and beyond in terms of helping us and giving us a great interview and giving great advice to people while he's still in the hospital. I'm grateful to my teachers and healers for allowing me on my journey uh, where I am today. Thank you to uh, Christina for another great show and Segovia and Yoga Hub and Magical Medical Tour and all our viewers. So until next time when we get together again, searching through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, I say goodbye, Scott, and thank you so much, and thank I wish you all optimal health. <laughs> thank you so much, Scott, for another empowering interview. You really have, uh, I, this show will give so many people that, that next level of balance. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you so much, and be well. We are always with you in spirit and sending that good healing energy towards you and your loved ones around you for support. And, of course, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. And, of course, we always have our wonderful Dr. Glenn Woolman to thank for these wonderful shows. You can connect with him through his website, glennwoolman.com, where we do encourage you to learn about his metaphor, Square Breath. We are always grateful for any feedback, comments, and suggestions. And remember, at any time during the show, you can simply type in your question or comments if you're watching the show online at any time, whether this be a year from now, um, two years from now, that's okay. We will make sure that we will try to get it to the person that you would like to uh, focus your question to and get you an answer. And if you are listening to this on a podcast or a device, please give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK and be sure to leave your contact information. Okay, thank you so much for joining us for another exciting and empowering show and we look forward to seeing you next time. Namaste. Like shrinking down and very feeling really weak. Even food didn't attract me, although I know that I was uh, craving sweets. I was craving quite a bit of sweets. Um, that was the only thing that I wanted to eat. And my sister was very, very upset. She was like, something is wrong. This is, you cannot lose weight this much. Um, so we prepared everything. We really insisted with the uh, insurance to see the doctor as soon as he got, a, got in. The nurses and everybody helped us at that moment. They saw that.